Specialising in philosophy of mind, Sam Coleman is a reader in philosophy at the University of Hertfordshire. Coleman's main work centres around questions concerning consciousness, predominantly on what has come to be known as the hard problem of consciousness. To paraphrase Colin McGinn, the problem could be summarised as follows. How does soggy grey matter give rise to vivid technicolor experience? In this episode, we're going to be focusing on Coleman's views concerning personhood, consciousness and God, specifically relating to pantheism. In a word, pantheism is the view that God is identical with the universe. As the pantheist slogan goes, God is everything and everything is God. If we are to think of personal identity as a stream of uninterrupted consciousness, Coleman argues that pantheism runs into significant problems. Instead, Coleman suggests an alternative theory of personhood, which leaves open the possibility of a personal God which is identical with the universe. As we will find, Coleman's view bridges fascinating philosophical questions concerning personal identity, the metaphysics of God and consciousness into original and exciting pantheist theory. This episode is the first in a four-part series on pantheism that will be released across 2019. As part of this series, we'll also be interviewing Emily Thomas, Claire Carlyle, and Andrei Bukharev. These episodes are sponsored by the Pantheism and Panentheism Project, which is led by Andrei Bukharev and Yuji Nagasawa and funded by the John Templeton Foundation. A huge thank you to the Pantheism and Panentheism Project for their support. As always, a huge thank you to Cullum St. Gabriel's and all of our patrons for supporting the show. A massive thank you in particular to Lily Hooper, David Legeness and Jim McClare. Lily, Jim and David, the holy trinity underpinning the Pansycast on behalf of every conscious mind listening today, thank you for your support. If you're enjoying the show and you're as awesome as Lily, Jim and David, head over to our Patreon page, that's patreon.com forward slash Pansycast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. In part one, we're going to look at personhood and consciousness and in part two we'll be looking at god as well as engaging in some further analyses and discussion thank you we hope you enjoy the show Hello and welcome to episode 57 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the uninterrupted stream of consciousness. That is Jack Symes. I'm joined once again by the man who we all wish would die in his sleep, Dr. Gregory Miller. Hello. <laughs> the weather watching, Miss Emily Rose Ogland. Hello. And the interrelated qualities of the whole entangled universe, Dr. Sam Coleman. Hi. Thanks for joining us on the show, Sam. Thanks for having me. So just before we jump into the show, um, listeners may be surprised, pleasantly surprised to hear we've got an additional co-host with us today, Emily Rose Ogland. Welcome, Emily. It's great to be here. Uh, Emily Rose, what is it you're, you're interested in, in pantheism? Where does that come from? Um, well, I guess I've always been interested in views that don't fit into standard dichotomies. And besides, the pa podcast itself shares the same prefix. So there you go. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So should we jump into some introductory questions? <laughs> that, that was a cue for you. <laughs> yeah, that was the cue for me to do it. Okay. okay, Sam, so the first question that we ask all of our guests, and I guess it's quite a simple question, but in many ways, uh, the simplicity is misleading. Uh, what is philosophy? That's a toughie. Um, I don't have anything strikingly original to say about that, but um, I, someone told me when I was doing a PhD that some continental philosopher, whose name escapes me now, said that, uh, philosophy is the attempt to be at home everywhere so mm. it's a sort of ultimate project for understanding so you're never at a loss no matter what the subject matter wherever you are it's the thing that integrates everything else so Russell has this idea that other f fields of knowledge specialize right the physicists do physics the biologists do biology and so on who are the people that stand back and try and integrate the whole lot so that they have a, a univocal picture of the whole universe and how everything fits in that's philosophy so I think it's sort of a mind worm that just keeps burrowing and it keeps asking why, why. It's never satisfied with the answers and it wants to take in the whole and see how everything fits together. So sort of unrelenting, um, depressing, illuminating um, thing you can't get rid of. We had Dan Dennett on the show who told us that he thought that the idea of philosophy was that you you work out the questions and you pass those questions on to science. Um, so with that in mind, do you think that philosophy makes progress? What's, what's the purpose of it, apart from, you know, like you say, seeing how it all hangs together? We've only just started doing philosophy. 
I mean, we haven't got a lot of it on record. Mm. We've got, you know, we go back to the ancient Greeks, and we know a bit about Egyptian philosophy. We don't know what pe people have always done philosophy. So we haven't been going at it that long. Um, I don't think we can uh, make much of a measure of our progress at this point. It's an enormous project. So I, don't, I think the the, uh, the question of uh, measuring philosophy by its progress is, is misguided. It's something mm. we can't avoid doing. Um, as I say, um, science you can do all the science in the world that you want but if you want to integrate that with reality with human experience there's only one discipline that's going to do that and that's philosophy so i i, I rather wholeheartedly disagree with dennett in fact um i would say that it's only philosophy that can get to the ultimate truth about uh. things whether we will i don't know but we can't stop trying how is it that you first got into the subject i was always argumentative um i was always spotting little chinks in people's armor and jumping in there and being annoying so i remember as a kid um this is a bit of a naughty story so i hope my dad's not listening but um <laughs> he'll remember this but he may he may have forgotten this episode but i was i was spying on the neighbors down the end of the garden and they were having a fight and they saw me looking through my brother's telescope at them and about 10 minutes <laughs> later we got a knock on the front door and the very angry husband was there saying your son's been spying on us and i i my dad called me down i was about eight years old at the time and i thought for a second and i said well if you saw me looking at you you must have been looking at me so you're just as bad and that's sort of the, the you know the germ of the ways of way of thinking that got me into philosophy um i had a really good religious studies teacher at school and mm. i decided i want to copy his entire life go to the same college <laughs> same uni as him and be a philosopher and so that's what i tried to do did he spy on people as a child as well um he didn't have very good eyesight so oh, okay. i think he well mind you he could have used a telescope as well but not to my knowledge if you didn't find yourself looking through this telescope and eventually following his path and becoming a philosopher what do you think you'd do for a living if, if you weren't a philosopher i'd be a detective <laughs> why why is this because that's also working out what happened and why who's responsible and making sense oh. of the whole picture albeit in a more limited context by i quite fancy doing that so i'm quite obsessed with detective shows poirot and all that sort of thing oh, excellent do you remember um then around this time of spying on the neighbours, etc., having any distinctly philosophical thoughts growing up? No. So were you just arguing about like everyday problems? You're just arguing for arguing's sake? When I was a kid? Mm. Oh, I think it was this thing I said about the worm. So I was always asking why. So, okay, so ah. here's one. I remember being taught at school that uh, we were doing angles, okay? So I, I could understand the idea of 90 degrees. You know, the teacher drew two lines mm. um, uh, and, and then did, you know, this little uh, this, uh, quadrant in the middle and, mm -hmm. and said that's 90 degrees. I could understand the angles in a triangle. But then at a certain point, he drew a line. Then he drew another line next to it to make a straight line. Line, and then he put a semicircle across them and this just completely floored me and I said well, why did you do that and he said this is an 100, 180 degree angle and I said I couldn't understand the idea of there being an angle there because there was no corner so I just said why would you do that why put it there and not here and I sort of looked all across the line and he couldn't he couldn't answer me and I, I just yeah I was I was always asking questions in math class in secondary school as well in science class my dad got me a GCSE chemistry book when I was eight and I mm. just you know would go through it and say well why are the why are the electrons like this why is it like this so it's just that it's just an annoying tendency to ask why about everything mm. and can you remember then the first philosophical text that you read then was this at university was this at high school can you remember what it was i don't think there was any one text i mean the, i don't i don't remember for sure the first thing i read I, I think for me, everything always led to philosophy. Like I say, this GCSE chemistry book led to philosophy. The idea of there being 180 degree angle on a line led to, led to philosophy. Um, I definitely read meditations as a teenager. I definitely read Russell's problems of philosophy. Um, but I, I think what really got me into philosophy, as in what made me really feel it was get, doing philosophy of mind at uni and reading what's it like to be a bat. That was the thing uh -huh. that really lit the fire that is still going today, if you like. I mean, I wanted to be a philosopher, but that really gave me a target and a belief and a thing that I really cared about. Mm -hmm. so, is this Thomas Nagels? So yeah. I, I don't know um, what it's like to be about. There's something it's like to be about that we, we just can't experience, is this the idea? Yeah, exactly. Oh, wonderful. We'll, we'll touch on this theme as, as, as we go, I'm sure. So like we say, um, that Rutger Bregman was our last guest and he was, uh, he was a Protestant and then he read Russell's Why Not a Christian and he becomes an atheist. And Eugen Nagasau, who's co-leading this pantheism and panentheism project, when we spoke to him, uh, as you might know, he moved from materialism and atheism to a form of uh, non-physicalism and and theism. So two big shifts, one moving from atheism to theism and theism to atheism. Has there been any big shifts in your thinking throughout your philosophical career? I, I 
I've never been a, a physicalist in the conventional sense, although mm. I would call myself a materialist in something like Galen Strawson's real materialism sense right. now. But I did start off as a dualist, I would say, which I'm not anymore. And and during my PhD, I I got and afterwards I got quite into panpsychism after being run over and hit on the head. Um, but I've I've moved away f- from panpsychism now to think that it's um, really quite wrong. So that's probably the biggest shift that's gone on to me. Um, and I didn't. I would have said that I was agnostic about God's existence, mm. whereas I, I would call myself now a, a theist or ah. a pantheist, as obviously. Good big shifts. So we know you're very interested in questions considering the philosophy of mind, but is there anything else that you're working on or anything you'd like to work on in the future? Um, I'm working on a model of the mind that sees it as mostly unconscious, but consisting in qualia, if people know what I mean by that. So people who obsess about consciousness and think everything is, you know, the panpsychists or the dualists, they're right about, as it were, what mind is like. It's qualitative in the, in the sense of qualia. But the materialists are right that, that consciousness is really not that, um, bigger deal or essential to the mind and you see that's kind of borne out in the picture in this so I'm ta- basically taking that 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 in this in-between view and applying it in loads of different areas so there's a as it applied it to God here I'm working on a, a paper on pain which um, has a, a intrinsically unconscious model of pain mm. um, in the future I hope to get into political philosophy which is mm. related in a way that I could explain but it would take me a little, <laughs> little bit of time but is that, this is going to link into political sorry that you, you that's a that's a fascinating idea can you unpack it and try and so I guess my question is, why do you think that this discussion of, of consciousness has anything to say about uh, political philosophy? So I don't believe that um, anyone's beliefs in different areas of philosophy are, are wholly unconnected or arbitrary with respect to each other. I don't think we can help but form a coherent view. So I believe that your areas in ethics, your, area, your, your beliefs in ethics, your beliefs in political philosophy, your philosophy of mind, they're connected with very deep roots. Mm. You may not be aware of those roots, but they are there to be uncovered. And I feel like I, I had certain political views, I had certain uh, philosophy of mind views and ethics views, and it was a question of uncovering the roots. And I feel like I'm now in the process of doing that. So that's something I hope to work more on in the future. But just to just tell you a couple of connections. Mm. I mean, it's a big, a, a big issue in political philosophy whether whether uh, e- economic agents are rational. Mm-hmm. So people sometimes object to a, a laissez-faire or, or you know, broadly free market capitalist arrangement of society by saying that would be all well and good if we were perfectly rational, but people are right. irrational and look at the kinds of things that they do. And then there's all this stuff in psychology that seems to show that when you rationalize an action, you're confabulating as in you're just making up a justification after mm. the fact. Mm. Um, but I think that relies on the assumption that it's what you consciously access that that exhausts your reasons. If you can't con- if you if you don't have conscious access to what your reason was, then what you did wasn't driven by reason. But as soon as you think that the mind might be more un- mostly unconscious, there's a whole other area of, of of reason that could be going on, and that would need to be ruled out in order to really say definitively that people weren't rational. So that's one connection. That's fascinating. It links in with the Rutger Bregman and the uh, Robert Wright things we've been looking at recently, and and this discussion as well. Greg, do you jump in? So the idea is something like there's a whole load of unconscious processing going on there. And in order to say, um, you know, we aren't, you know, irrational agents, really, we could still be rational ones. We need to rule out that that's the unconscious processing is there. It's not rational. You may well be reasoning perfectly uh, adequately. It's just that it's not something that you've conscious access to right now. It was going on unconsciously. I also think you can say quite a similar thing about the Liebert experiments when it comes to free will, by the way. So there's, there's many, I mean, I can say, say something about that if you like. But you, They get patients in a room and the patients stare at a clock and on the clock they can see the hands going round and then they ask the patients, I say they, I think it's the guy called Benjamin Liebert and his colleagues, they ask the patients when you have the urge to raise your arm press the button and take note of what time it said on the clock. Uh-huh. And in a roundabout way, the results find, or not the results find, that Benjamin and his colleagues find, is that mental processing, I think it's called an action potential for the person to raise their hand, comes a significant amount of time before the person consciously has the idea or recognizes that they had the idea to move their arm in the, in the air, for instance. Something, the idea being like the reasons for your actions are unconscious and come before you are ever aware of them. Is mm. that right, Sam? Yeah, so there's a neural event, an action potential that precedes the 
conscious deci- a conscious decision to move your arm by I think it's about half a second. Hmm. So people infer from that that your conscious mind is not in charge of what you do, and they further infer that you're not free. It wasn't really your decision. But of course, that assumes that you didn't unconsciously decide. Right. And if you did unconsciously decide, that could coincide with the neural event, and it could still be you doing it, and you could still be f- free. So again, there's an assumption that we are, as it were, ident- to be identified with our conscious selves. Mm-hmm. And as soon as you get outside of that, um, which is what I'm trying to do a whole load of cool stuff opens up that we can say. Part one, personhood and consciousness. Sam, so today we're going to be discussing pantheism. So would you mind explaining to us, um, to our listeners, what pantheism is and perhaps what drew you towards researching pantheism? Um, so pantheism is, well, if, if theism is the idea that God created the universe, the universe is something then therefore separate from God. And panentheism is the idea that the universe is a part of God, but not all of God. Pantheism is the idea that the universe and God coincide. Perhaps they're identical or perhaps as we would say, one real, uh, the universe realizes God. That's the way I would put it. So, yeah. What drew me to pan- pantheism? I don't know what to say apart from that it's such a cool view. Mm. It's just, it's the most, if you've got God and you've got the universe, what's the neatest, most elegant way of arranging them? Well, make them identical or as near as. So there's one argument in favour of it. And does this, is this it being cool and one argument in favour tie into your kind of view of what, the, what philosophy is? And it's the big picture, why bringing everything together? Is this why you think, oh, look, I can have God, I can have all these other views and look, I brought them together. Yeah, that sounds right. So you're investigating the universe. You're res- investigating. Uh, Sellers got this f- the phrase that something like to find out how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense. Mm. And it's in doing that you should you you eventually would arrive at God. And yes, so the the project to understand the universe, the project to understand God, and the relation of God to the universe would be one and the same project on on that view. So it would turn out to be. So yeah, that makes sense to me. Okay, so let's explore this idea that God is the universe and he's also a person a little more. So we could ask what is per- what are persons and lots of people out there in the literature, um, for instance, uh, Barry Dainton or Galen Strawson, think, well, persons, I, the things that we are, are, we're just our own streams of consciousness, right? And this is this view that we are streams of consciousness, Sam, is w- the starting point of your paper. Could you tell us more about this view? So um, Hume's an empiricist, so he's looking to find uh, data reg- regarding what the self is. So he looks in, he does introspection, he looks into a stream of consciousness, trying to find the self. It seems like a good way of going about it. The self is going to be a mental or mind-related entity, if it's if it's anything. And what does he find? He funches, finds a bunch of mental contents, and so he identifies his self, his, his self with those. Or, or that's one reading. Another reading is he doesn't find any self and it eliminates mm. it, but... Yeah. So Sam, in the paper you call this the insight, don't you? What Hume was talking about? Yeah, the insight is the idea that um, the the self of so- is something of which one can be directly conscious mm. as such. And I agree with people who identify the self with the stream of consciousness that that that. Uh, the, the self is something that shows up in consciousness and for people who would deny that I think they've got a problem motivating the posit of a self at all if the, if the self isn't something that shows up in one's first person mental life it's hard to see what reason you could have to posit such a heavyweight metaphysical item at all good so so if we establish the view that you know I am a my stream of consciousness and, and this thing doesn't end uh, Descartes view as you know in your paper is that this, this never does come to an end uh, but Galen Strawson our previous guest um, you know, as you as you know yourself, he says that every fifteen minutes, I just lose like uh, my my flow of consciousness. Everyone might you might have daydreamed fifteen minutes during this episode already. Just your mind's wondered. You think, ah, oh, I might need to go back and think that bit through. Your your extreme consciousness has stopped. So does that mean within the fifteen minutes of this episode that that I've died? Do you want do, do I need a new name? There was one of the Galen Strawson's I've interacted with did say that, but the the most recent one who I asked that question denied that any of his an, his ancestors had ever said that. So I don't I couldn't say what the current Galen Strawson's view is, but yes, that would seem to be an implication of that view. Of course, I don't think that we are identical with our streams of consciousness, mm. and you know what that's one one reason is 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 exactly that that we would be as it were dying every fifteen minutes or so. Um, 
or on the other hand, we'd have to be conscious all the way throughout sleep and never nodding off as Descartes believed. And while sometimes I can find that plausible, um, I can't find it wholly plausible enough to believe it all the time. Right. So uh, we're all going to go to sleep tonight unless we're we're partying all night or something like this. So we're all going to die this evening still. If I can retain my focus for more than 15 minutes, um, but eventually I'll need to go to sleep and I, I will die. And this is a really sad event. As long as there's, as long as, as long as there's a period of dreamless sleep, a period of genuine lack of consciousness, assuming you're not dreaming throughout your sleep um, or, or mulling something over consciously, even though your eyes are closed and so on, then yes, according to the view in which you're identical with your stream of consciousness, naturally, if the stream of consciousness ends, so do you. You cease to exist for that time. Okay, so we have this problem. If I am my stream of consciousness and I go into a dreamless sleep, it looks like I've ceased to exist and I wake up the next morning and it's a wholly new me or something like this. Or in Galen Strawson's case, a new one every 15 minutes. Haven't these people tried to kind of resolve the problem? So I think Barry Dainton has a view that you mentioned in the paper and um, John Foster, Barry Dainton's supervisor, also has a view on this. So they have ways of... of trying to join up the two ends of the stream of consciousness. So ways of saying that it's the same you in the morning, the, the stream of consciousness gets reignited or something like that. Or you exist rather like a, a siren, the sound of a siren comes and goes, you know, the police siren flashes and, and, mm. and sounds out and now, now it's stopped, but the same siren sound comes back. So you have a gappy existence. That's fine. That's not really my problem. My problem is more the implication that during dreamless sleep, you do not, you literally do not exist. Right. So in the paper, I talk about this example with Foster. If you came into the room while Foster was dreamlessly asleep, mm-hmm. there would be nobody in the bed. That's <laughs> the literal implication. And Galen Strawson tries to equivocate on, you know, person or self and says there's a sense of it in which it's just the human body. But and I don't find that a very satisfying answer. Mm-hmm. So that's my, that's my core motivation for moving away from the consciousness centered view of selves. What about the view, though, that I think you talk about this one in the paper, Barry Dainton's view that myself is a kind of, you know, a group of powers to bring about an experience. So what is a power? Some, you know, like a power is, you know, the disposition to bring about a manifestation. So I think the example used in the paper, Sam, is that um, a vase is fragile. It means it has the power to break or salt has uh, water has the power to dissolve salt. Right. Um, Barry's view is nice, but it, it's literally giving up the ghost because the whole point about those powers is they're not themselves conscious properties. So if if the self is identical with those powers, the self is not conscious. In fact, the self is not something that can ever become um, manifest in its own stream of consciousness. So that would be losing the insight. Uh, it's giving up the whole the whole um, yeah. It's giving up the, the the view that motivated position right so we say that you know, the stream of consciousness is is what we are and barry dane's view is that it's not the stream of consciousness that you are it's this thing that gives rise to this consciousness this power which enables it to be so i fall asleep you know i stay this power is still there it's just not activated it's kind of like a um think of a, a television you know it gives rise to this thing but the television is still there um and that's what you are and you're saying no you're, you're not doing justice to this this insight that i you know, I am my consciousness. Is this right? That's why he's giving up the ghost. Is this right? He, I, I thought he was trying to defend the view that the self is something that can manifest directly in consciousness, right? which is behind the experience or, or consciousness-based view. But if the self is consists in powers to cause consciousness, it's not consciousness itself, it's not something that can appear in consciousness, mm-hmm. then he loses the insight. So, you know, you want to, you want to identify yourself with the the picture, the, the, the live TV, the bright mm-hmm. lights, but it turns out you're just the TV set. Ah, okay. The dead gubbins within, you know, it's not, it's not very satisfying. Okay, so Sam, you think that, you know, these sorts of kind of, you might may say piecemeal approaches to getting around this problem of what happens when I sleep, right? That what we call the bridging problem. Um, think, let's put these to one side because instead you have a kind of nice overall picture, right? And you said it answers two important questions and you give us this proposal that is unconscious qualities, right? And this can, these can persist during unconsciousness and they can also vindicate the insight as it were. Could you explain this proposal for us? Um, So I think that uh, you're aware of a whole bunch of qualitative contents when you open your eyes i mean just to take the most simple visual case the 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 colors you see we would say we would call them visual qualia in 
in you know philosophical terminology um so most people who believe in qualia at all t think that they are essentially conscious they're properties that only exist as experience could you just tell us what what qualia is so uh so i'm looking i can see your red chair so there's a there's a, a, a visual redness in my in my visual field mm -hmm. so that would be a, an instance of a qualia the qualia of redness mm -hmm. so qualia is one such property qualia if you're looking at a rainbow you'd see lots of different colors so uh. you'd be seeing a whole bunch of qualia other kinds of qualia would be your bodily sensations of different kinds perhaps there are qualia of thought mm -hmm. and so on if that's, if that so helps. experiences of these things rather than the things in themselves uh <laughs> Qualia are the properties that make your experiences resemble and differ. Right. Okay. Okay, good. So coffee taste is different from lemon taste because they involve different qualia. Whether or not you really have a, a lemon on your tongue or are just dreaming it, you still have a, a quality of experience. And that's what I mean by quale. So most people who believe in them think that they are things that can only exist in experience. But I think they're properties that can come in and out of experience. They come in and out of experience. So they're, they're things there, like the, let's take the lemon example. The lemon's there and it's yellow and it has the properties that would give rise to the experience of bitterness on the tongue or something. But they don't have to be on my tongue for them to, the quality to exist. Um, the thought is, so forget the lemon, I'm really talking about the, the lemon taste. So <laughs> right, okay, okay, what I'm saying is that very property, which we would think of as a mental property, if it's a property at mm -hmm. all, the, 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 quali the quality of the, of the taste sensation can exist without you being aware of it. So it can exist untasted, if you like, an untasted taste, which makes it sound ridiculous, but that's the view. Okay, so just to summarize, we've got, we have this view that I am my stream of consciousness, but I fall asleep and, and then I die. But you say, no, you don't die because consciousness just isn't things that are active in one's mind, but things that can be unconscious as well. It's a bit like this. Uh, so I think the, 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 the consciousness view or the experiential view, as I call it, says that you're a bit like a, a, a movie being being played. So you exist for as long as the projector's going and the, and the, and the, 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 the um, image is being projected on the, on the TV screen. And if that stops, which is what happens during dreamless sleep, the implication is you cease to exist. I identify you with the film. Oh. So the film has got colors in it. It's got qualia, if you like, built in. But sometimes the light is being shone through it. Sometimes it's not. When it is, that's consciousness. When it's not, the stream of as it were, qualia is still there. That's my view. Okay, good. So um, listeners might think back to our Freud episode or something. It's something like this thing of the iceberg in the ocean. And just because they're under the ocean doesn't mean they're not there. Could you liken it to this analogy? Yeah, I prefer my analogy, but <laughs> okay. I, I like Freud too. <laughs> awesome. But actually it's not my analogy. It's I should say it's Leo Steubenberg has got this really cool way of explaining unconscious okay. qualia in terms of um, unprojected cine film. So, yeah. good. so why think this is the case? Like, wh Why think that there are these... These, uh, these qualia which are under the surface, but they're just not in the forefront of our minds. Actually, you asked me earlier about views that I've repudiated. And I used to argue with a friend during my PhD who was massively into Freud and the unconscious. And he he kept pressing me to to endorse the existence of the unconscious and I refused. I was a real <laughs> Cartesian dualist type at that point. Mm. I suppose, but I've now come around completely the other way and I think most of the mind consists in not just unconsciousness but unconscious qualia. So um, there's, for the record, been that big shift. Yeah, Why good. I think there are such properties? Because they explain things. So uh, here's an example I, I love <laughs> raising with the students. Uh, in fact, I did it just yesterday and it's surprising how many people identify with this experience. So, uh, a, fr a friend or a loved one comes to you with a piece of good news. I've just managed to do X, you know, I've succeeded in X. And you, you, you start to say, oh, congratulations. And you, you want and expect your voice to come out in such a way as ple uh, to be pleased for them. Mm -hmm. Your voice comes out bitter and resentful. <laughs> and you realize that you must actually be angry with them. Right. And perhaps if you dig hard enough, you can even find and feel the anger. So I would say there that you've got an unconscious anger quale that's, that's uh, feeding into your voice quality. Mm -hmm. And you might think, well, why say that? The point is, if you were consciously angry with them and your uh, uh, your tone of voice came out like that, that would be a, a clear explanation of why you'd, you'd, you'd had that tone. The, the conscious anger feeling would explain it perfectly. Well, in the absence of a conscious anger feeling, the natural thing to posit is an unconscious anger. Mm. You give the example in the paper about driving as well. So we had a long driving drive here today and uh, suddenly I, I broke hard in the car. I was in autopilot on the way and everyone was a little bit shook up. Um, is, this an, is this more evidence in favor of this unconscious mind? 
It could be. I see. I don't think it's knocked down, but the point is right. it would explain such cases quite neatly. So you stopped at a red light. So on some some level, the redness of the light registered with you. Mm-hmm. Now there is an explanation that goes via brute wavelengths and a sort of blind sighter type account of that. You just uh, you process the wavelengths in one way or another, and that made you stop. But again, in the conscious case, the natural explanation would be it's the redness of the light, which would be right. a quale that stopped you that that made you decide to stop. So I just say exactly the same thing happened in the absence of consciousness. Mm-hmm. seems to me a very neat explanation and then there are pains that wake you up in the night wake me up in the night so i'm, I'm asleep and then all of a sudden i feel like a headache or a and then i'm, I'm brought to I'm suddenly i'm aware of it but it was there beforehand before i felt it in my mind's eye so people who suffer from migraines and i'm lucky enough to be one of those people um can have a sensation that the same headache persists for days uh. so you go to sleep and you you know you're going to be rid of it in one way or another but you wake up in the morning with qualitatively much the same pain there mm. and you can't help the imp- avoid it. You can't avoid the impression that it's the very same headache that was there before. The, the headache can even wake you up in the night if it's bad enough or think of the pain of a, an injury that you're carrying. Mm-hmm. Um, so the thought is, if I'm dreamlessly asleep, I'm unconscious. Uh, if it's literally, if it's pain that wakes me up, if it's truly a pain, pain is a quale, then um, a quale has caused me to come to consciousness. But I wasn't conscious of the quale before because it's mm-hmm. caused me to be conscious. So that would be an unconscious quale. And again, there are all kinds of ways of wriggling, wriggling out of that conclusion, but it seems to me quite straightforward. Just to put pressure on one of them, pe- students and people I say this to tend to say, well, some neural event caused me to wake up. Right. But of course, if it's a pain-free neural event, then it's false that the pain woke you up. To really say that the pain woke you up, you have to say that a quale woke you up. And if it really woke you up, brought you from unconsciousness to consciousness, it wasn't conscious. So... Those are some reasons for positing them. They do explanatory work. In our episode with David Papanow and Philip Goff, David Papanow talks about this at the end of the episode, uh, you know, feeling things while one is asleep, right? And he says, oh, well, no, this is, um, you're still conscious while you're asleep. You're just not what um, philosopher Ned Block has called access conscious of that thing. So somehow that isn't, um, integrated into all the other mechanisms of one's mind or something like this. Is oh. that not also a possible explanation? I guess it could be, but I I, I can't really make sense of phenomenal consciousness without access consciousness. Mm. So I like, I like block stuff on that. But when he says you've got a, a phenomenally conscious, you know, a, a, f- a phenomenally conscious property that you can't access, I'm tempted to say that's that's a property that lacks phenomenal consciousness and that's why you can't access it. Um, yeah. Good. And you're not saying here this is a knockdown argument. Like he's, you're just saying this is a reasonable view to hold. So you, like the unconscious mind or quale, you're saying we, we've just got good reason to think that there is quale out there. It explains things that happen. It explains bits of behavior. Um, thinking about the other side, I'm, I'm not really sure what the arguments are that quale have got to be conscious, other than mm. the fact that we always find them in consciousness. But that's that's conflating epistemology with metaphysics. Oh, okay. It's a bit like my cat thinking that milk can only exist in bowls because that's where she finds it, right? <laughs> Good. So it seems as if our experiences have this ability to come together in a certain sense, right? So when I observe a piece of art, maybe I can see it as one unified whole, like Van Gogh's sunflowers, the yellowness of the petals and the brownness of the seeds in the center um, look coherent. How is it that uh, these unconscious qualities can f- form one unified experience on your view? Um, I must confess, I don't think I understand the question in this case, but um, so maybe you could you could tell me what it is that my view struggles to explain that a view can explain that says that these qualia are all conscious. Why would that integrate them any better? Okay, so Barry Dayton has this view that there's a certain togetherness that occurs when we look at a painting, for example. So I might see the yellowness of the petals on one hand, on the one hand, but then also a certain brownness of the center. But together they form this this whole. Do you also have that view? Um, no, I don't. I don't honestly know what Barry's talking about. So for me, there's the the colors you see, the sensations you feel, the coffee you're tasting. He thinks that there's something it's like to have all of those, but there's something it's like to have them all together, which is a, an additional mm-hmm. positive feature of the experience. I don't recognize that um, beyond the fact that there are 
quali you're aware of that I'm not aware of. Now, what marks the fact that they're uh, ones you're aware of or I'm not ones I'm not aware of? What marks us off is the fact that the qualia in your experience have got certain relations they bear to one another, or the possibility of certain relations, and it doesn't apply to the qualities that I experience. So, for example, if you if you if you feel an itch quali, you can suppress that with by pinching yourself or by mm-hmm. scratching it. But your but my itch can never be suppressed by your scratch. Your pain quali won't do anything to my itch. So that there are certain relations that are uh, the qualia in your field bear to one another that they don't bear to the uh, qualia in my field and that marks us off as different people and that's that's the basis of, for me of the the unity and the distinctness of, of of selves okay so there's these relations within within me um and that's why it's happening uh, it's this qualia is being experienced by me and and not you but what do you mean by these relations like it's it's just these qualitative relations these experiences only can happen within within a human being am i missing the point here um not i don't say that they could only happen within a human being but just to consider human minds you know we get on to weirder minds in a bit won't we um i mean if you if you're tasting coffee qualia because you're just having a cup of coffee but there's not enough it's not sweet enough you'll dump Mm. some sugar in to cause yourself some sweetness qualia now the coffee qualia and the sweetness qualia inform one another they interact there's a plausibly a new qualitative whole produced by Mm. the by the two qualia coming together but obviously the sweetness that i experience can't inform the coffee taste that's over there in your in your field so that there is there's a there's a field of qualities over there associated with your brain another one associated with my brain and it, the, the qualia within each within each group, if you like, uh, they bear they bear the possibility of certain relations with with one another. They can change each other's quality. They can form new gestalts. It's quite a good way of putting it. But those relations are not possible between um, our our respective fields, and that, that marks them off as distinct. And how do these uh, qu- unconscious qualities become conscious in your mind, Sam? Then, so to go back to Jack's example of Freud, how is it that it goes from uh, underneath the kind of dark sea of my ocean of my mind to the kind of you know uh, glossy you know technical surface to go back to column again from the start so um herbert feigl's got this nice idea that consciousness consists in one brain area scanning or tapping as he puts it another one and i think the brain is wholly made of qualities because i'm a kind of weird Russellian monist um, so I think underneath all the nature of physical matter ultimately bottoms out in things that are qualia-like, albeit not intrinsically conscious. So I think that your awareness of a bit of your qualitative brain is this kind of tapping or scanning by another area. This Russellian monism, do you just very briefly, if it, I know it's a, it's a big idea, but just for the listeners, uh, you say underlying everything is this, is this, is this qualia, these experiences? What this ain't this seems pretty crazy. So underneath this chair, there's these conscious properties underlying it. What do you mean by this? So it, it's called Russellian monism because it's it's uh, it stems from a view of science that we take from Bertrand Russell, which is that if you like science, especially physics, tells you what physical things do, how they behave, but it doesn't really tell you what they are, what their underlying nature is, what they're like, if you want to put it in those terms. Mm. So we know all about how an electron interacts with a, a gravitational field, how inter- how electrons interact with each other. We know a lot about what they do, mm-hmm. but what is an electron? I've tried asking my close physicist friend, um, and he just doesn't care. He says, I just care about my equations. <laughs> I just you know which is a way of saying i just care about what the thing does i don't care about what it is in fact he doesn't right. even acknowledge that as a question um but so uh if you think that uh, there is a, uh, an answer to the question what is the thing more you know what grounds its behavior you you might be looking for another kind of property other than these dispositions and these doings or potentials mm. for doing and panpsychists answer that question by saying these are experiences in other words experienced conscious qualities qualia and i say well their their qualities are right but you know in line with what i've been saying they needn't be experienced which frankly makes the view a bit less wacky even though it's still wacky yeah, good. I like how you went from these textbooks and science. You're saying, why do these things happen to actually just hassling people in a, in a university and asking the same questions? Just yes. So the, when, when we're asking, you know, at the start, were you asking philosophical questions when you were growing up? You're saying you're reading the chemistry book and you're asking why, and now you're just asking the chemist uh, why. To, to yeah, it's the that. same. I hadn't really noticed, but you're right. Yeah, so I <laughs> haven't changed since I was eight. Like follows, a true detective, really. Yeah. True detective. Who says after 15 minutes you change. This is how you persist throughout time. (laughs) Okay, Sam. So in summary then, your view is something like this. Persons 
unlike Strawson or Dainton, aren't conscious streams that maybe last as long as we awake during the day and go to sleep at night or 15 minutes. But instead, persons are unconscious qualities that exist within my brain, sometimes below the surface, and then sometimes they're illuminated and they become conscious, somewhat like the uh, projector celluloid film example you gave us. So persons are bundles of unconscious qualities. That's perfect, yeah. Um, so it's exactly like the consciousness view, the Strawson or Descartes view, but with consciousness taken out. So they think you are ident- you right now you're experiencing a whole bunch of bodily qualia, visual qualia, uh, f- you know, thought conscious thoughts and feelings, and you are identical with the unif- phenomenally unified bundle of those conscious qualities. Mm. So I say you are constituted by just such a bundle, but consciousness is inessential to it. So it's just those very qualities, those very thoughts and and f- feelings and color qualia and bodily qualia. Those con- those those do indeed constitute you, but they can all exist without the light of awareness on them and that's how you persist during dreamless sleep so you are you are a stream you're a stream of qualia but just not conscious qualia and indeed even as regards your conscious mind um consciousness is completely incidental inessential to to you to your mind to yourself it's a qualitative mind but one that, to which awareness is not essential so if i never had a conscious thought oh, actually we'll pause that's a nice way to end into yeah, the guitar yeah. there why would i open another can of worms at the end what was the bit? what was the um, I was just going to link in. I think we'll, it'll come up later when we're yeah, talking about I never had a chance. Yeah. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pansai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pansycast. The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at the Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. Yeah, it was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)